but we are going to be moving over these transitions well into our next talk. We'll be bringing on Davide, Barnabé, and Justin to be talking about economics meets Mevconomics. And we'll be starting with the presentation. So um, we are kind of um, going to have like a fireside chat discussion on the lay of the land more broadly. Like we start with like um, a brief um, a pitch introduction for me, then Justin, then Barnaby, and then uh, probably going to have like a longer Q&A. Uh, so I can go to the next slide. And I'm going to start um, at a high level uh, defining um, uh, MEV flows kind of from first principle. So if we go to the next slide. So essentially, um, what I want to start is that these MEV flows are actually a property, not of the blockchain itself, but uh, of the economy that uh, we build on top of blockchain. So like the system of value transfer, uh, which includes also like the economic and financial games that people play um, uh, on top. Uh, and so they kind of affect uh, the Ethereum protocol, but also the in trustless infrastructure or hopefully trustless infrastructure on the Ethereum protocol. And then like any other protocols that user um, uh, may use. Um, so essentially, um, when we think about um, how can we make Ethereum protocol MEV resilient, um, which is an idea that uh, I put forth uh, a few days ago, um, we actually need to think about how the whole system can be MEV resilient, right? And these properties, uh, which I call uh, blockchain SCC properties, so security, equity, and cost efficiency, like some of them are inherited directly uh, from the blockchain, but some of them relate to the broader uh, system, right? Um, so um, essentially, like, um, uh, what are these properties? Like, the first one is economic security which in the context of MEV, uh, we know that it changes the incentives from validators to behave honestly. So we want to build uh, incentives that are robust to MEV with like some of the solutions uh, we are developing is essentially to make these incentives uh, robust to this uh, process that uh, arose um, and that now it's a constant because people are playing these DeFi games continuously. Uh, the second property is uh, equity. So here uh, we think about equity both um, in um, access. Uh, so essentially, like uh, people should not be censored, but also equity in distribution. Uh, people should um, uh, have a fair game and um, have a fair distribution uh, of value, like uh, comparable to like, the um, and externalities they introduce to the system. So we want to minimize the losses for honest user. And then the third one is cost efficiency, which uh, affects a fourth pro property, which is the utility uh, of using the blockchain. Um, and here, essentially, we want an ethical user, a user that are just there to like play the game of extracting red, to have minimal reds. So this is kind of uh, the high level goal we are um, trying to achieve. And, and I will argue there is like four ingredients to achieve this. Uh, so the first one is uh, we need to reduce MEV with clever design. So essentially, um, both uh, at the game level, so the economic apps that we build uh, should be cleverly designed to account for MEV, and also at the meta game level, at the transaction inclusion game, also that one should be uh, cleverly designed uh, to uh, account for MEV, and that's what most people in this uh, group are working on. Um, and then the second step is extraction. So, like, there is a potential MEV in the system. Uh, this uh, uh, can cause instabilities uh, to incentives. So, we need uh, an efficient technology for extraction. Today, this is searchers and builder. Um, then the third one is uh, capture. So, once the MEV is extracted, we need to make sure that uh, this is captured and this needs to be captured by trustless protocol. It doesn't need to be entirely the Ethereum protocol. It can be uh, order flow auctions or other protocol uh, that are in the broader infrastructure, but it does need to be trustless because um, otherwise uh, there is going to be capture and like um, uh, this um, mechanism will not be credible. Uh, and then finally, 
uh, MEV allocation is uh, very important because essentially like uh, once we capture this MEV, we essentially need to make sure that um, this uh, flows back uh, to um, the users uh, or essentially maybe we can talk uh, about this a little bit more. What should be the goal of allocation? Of so if we go to the next slide. So uh, here is a cartoon view of uh, the block supply chain, um, which kind of includes, uh, if you stir at it for a little bit, all the elements that we are seeing today, uh, including the bad elements, exclusive order flow, vertical integration between searcher and builder, uh, horizontal uh, competition at different layer, maybe stronger versus not stronger than the segmentation. Um, and then finally, uh, MEV take can differ at different layers. So if you look at this, you realize that although we would want a clean supply chain, we actually have a supply network where like uh, there is several connections across layers. Uh, so we kind of need to uh, be aware of this. Um, and, uh, and essentially, uh, if we go to next slide, uh, what uh, we started doing is like looking closer uh, into all the important uh, metrics of uh, the supply network. We launched a uh, rig open problem, um, which is uh, essentially a, a way to advance research around like more complex uh, uh, properties of this supply network. So essentially like, uh, what we are going to try to do is create an open source framework to both define and measure these most more complex metrics that are related to inclusion delays, they create for different uh, segments of the market, validator devi deviations from honest behavior, and uh, our goal is to bring together multiple parties in the ecosystem. We already have people from Flashbots, Block Native, AGFI, Uniswap Labs that uh, are looking with us at uh, what's happening concretely into the market in order to then uh, use this data to like design uh, better protocols and systems. And uh, this is all for me. I believe uh, Justin is up next. Okay, great. Thanks, Davide. Um, so today I want to talk about uh, MEV precedents, uh, which I guess I just named uh, today, which is what is the the ordering in which um, you know, MEV to which parties the MEV should should flow to. Like, who should have precedence uh, on the MEV over over other parties? And basically, um, in, in my mind, um, we have uh, we have two types of precedence lists. We have the the the, the precedence list that we want and the the, the precedence list that we have, and those those are actually uh, different today. So, uh, in terms of uh, what we want, I think is we want to give um, users precedence over all other um, types of, of participants uh, over the, the MEV. So if they create MEV, they should be the ones that capture it through this concept of, of rebates, you know, called MEV share and things like that. And then uh, my claim is that the, the next uh, entity in the, the precedence list should be uh, holders, the token holders. And um, the way that they receive these these flows is through uh, burn. So we already have uh, part one of the burn, which is EIP one five five nine. You know, I think of the base fees as actually part of MEV, right? It's it's uh, it's not fancy or sophisticated MEV, but it is uh, uh, extractable value, and it turns out to be extracted by uh, by ETH holders. And there's this other idea called MEV burn, which is kind of part two of the burn, uh, where all the MEV, not just one part of it. Uh, goes to the holders. So already from these, these these two items in the precedence list, kind of the the way that I I, I see where we want to be moving towards is users capturing all the MEV that uh, they they initiate, and then all the rest or almost all the rest going to 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 the holders. Um, and now the reality is that there is a, a whole you know MEV pipeline or chain or network, whatever you want to call it of of um, intermediaries, and uh, you know these intermediaries will will capture a little bit of of MEV, but um, they will capture a very small minority. And you know in the competitive market, these these uh, 
should the, the, the inefficiency should go, should go to zero. Um, and the, the reason why I ordered um, these, uh, these entities in, in, in the way here is basically the closer you are to the user, um, the, the, the higher the precedence you should have. So if you're an interface, for example, you're very, very close to the user. You, you provide value by you know, bringing the user onto Ethereum. And so you should have precedence over the searcher. The searcher is doing you know, complicated stuff uh, in terms of, of building the bundles. And that's, that's maybe more valuable than, 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 than the builder, which is just bundle merging. And then the relay is doing something even less valuable. And then the proposer is just doing almost nothing. Like the, the only thing that they're doing is that they, they're receiving a few bids and then they're picking the highest bid and they're signing it. Um, they're doing almost almost no work. Um, now, it turns out in terms of what we have today for the users, I put the, the skull emoji here, that the, the users are being, uh, are being, you know, not receiving the flows. And so they're, 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 they're not being prioritized in, in, in this precedence list uh, at all. Um, and in position number one, what we have is the proposer. So the proposer who, you know, it should be, in my opinion, the very bottom of the precedence list is right now at the very top of the precedence list. And that, that is something that, uh, that I think uh, needs to be fixed. Um, and um, w one of the, 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 the cool things of, 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 of this kind of model is that we have a, a clean definition of, of, of a toxic MEV. And it's basically this idea that um, it's MEV that doesn't respect the precedence list. Um, or at least the, the ideal precedence list. So in this case, any MEV that should be going to the users, but instead is going to the proposer is toxic MEV. So you know, things like things like front running and, 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 and sandwiches. Um, and, and you could argue that maybe uh, proposers, you know, uh, receiving, receiving uh, MEV that doesn't originate from the users is also toxic. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that later because it, it leads to all sorts of um, <clears throat> economic distortions that, that, that manipulate the, the incentives that we've, we, 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 we've tried to, to bake into the protocol uh, as designers. Um, and then in terms of what we have, again, we have these, these more commoditized entities that will receive uh, a small portion of the, of the MEV uh, in, in a competitive uh, market. Okay, now I want I want to talk about maybe what is the most controversial thing of this this whole diagram, which is you know why should holders have precedence over the 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 the, the proposers, and this goes back to this idea of um, these economic distortions that happens when you give the MEV to the proposer, <clears throat> and so. Um, the way that we give MEV to the to the holders is through through MEV burn. I won't explain how it works. That's for another talk. But I'll explain some of the the, the advantages of it. So on the left, uh, we'll have uh, distortions that happen if you give the uh, the MEV to the proposer. So the very first one is this idea of reorgs, short term reorgs. So if you have a, a very valuable block, a hundred ETH, a thousand ETH, ten thousand ETH, a hundred thousand ETH, who knows? Uh, you know, in a single in a single block. Then really you're, you're you're putting a lot of pressure on the chain to do these short-term reorgs, and we haven't seen that right you know yet, but it it it, it might happen uh, you know with as the market becomes more 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 sophisticated and, and more mature. So that's the first thing that is not good when you give the MEV to the proposer. Um, the second thing which is not great when you give MEV to the proposer is that you're basically introducing a lottery. All the Proposers are lottery participants. They have each have lottery tickets, and as in you know most lotteries, uh, almost everyone is a loser, right? Almost everyone doesn't win the lottery, and then there's like the one person, the one proposer who wins the jackpot at the expense of everyone else. And in order to correct for this fact that almost everyone is a is a loser, the proposers need to pool, and that creates you know centralization vectors. It goes against uh, solo validating and things like that. So. That's the second economic distortion that we would avoid if we were uh, giving the MEV to the holders as opposed to the proposers. Um, the the third uh, economic uh, distortion is is what I call rug pools. So it's pooling is rugging the pools, um, and 
here the, the the observation is that even if you have a pooling system, it, it, it it's still not incentive aligned. And the reason is that um, the 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 operator of a of a validator that's part of a pool has an incentive to to basically not give the 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 MEV to the pool if the MEV is large enough, specifically is larger than their collateral or their reputation. So if there's a massive block that comes in, 10,000 ETH block, and you know they only operate one validator with 32 ETH, you know they're happy to to say, okay, the pool you can keep the 32 ETH as my as my collateral, but I'm gonna run away. I'm gonna rock pool uh, with the 10,000 ETH. And so um, if you're even if you like the concept of pools, you know, like like Rocket Pool or Lido, um, MEV Burn actually makes these pools uh, better because it, rem it removes the the rug pooling. And then the 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 the, the fourth uh, economic distortion that I want to highlight is this idea of drought. So there's there's two use cases for ETH, right? There's the the, the staking, which is economic security, and then there's this other very important use case, which is economic bandwidth. So for example, we're going to need decentralized stable coins that are backed by pristine collateral by ETH. And if we're in a in a bull market, let's say where you know MEV is just gone crazy, then what's going to happen is that the 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 incentive to become a staker are going to grow, and all the ETH is going to be sucked into staking, and then that's going to dry up the the ETH for the uh, economic bandwidth, and it's basically going to to fight the Ethereum economy. Um, so in a way, the the chain is kind of too successful, and it's 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 overpaying for security, and that leads to a less economic um, bandwidth for for the rest of the ecosystem. And then another thing that that's not on this slide, but I I just uh, kind of remembered is that if you're giving the <clears throat> the MEV to the proposers, you're kind of incentivizing people to use um, derivatives as 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 collateral. And, and my my personal belief is that. And if derivatives um, are, are, are risky to use as collateral because they can lose all their value from one day to another through, through slashing. And so they're, they're not high-grade collateral. And ideally, ideally, they should be avoided if you're building things like uh, decentralized uh, stablecoins. And in terms of the, the good things, if you give uh, the MEV to the holder, you have basically more scarcity. You know, you, you increase the shelling point that ETH is, is money for the internet and that Ethereum is a settlement layer for the internet of value. Um, but <clears throat> ironically, you, you're also increasing the, the rewards uh, for, for, for stakers, even though you're removing the MEV portion. And uh, <clears throat> the reason is that the, the, the rewards are going to tend to the cost of value in either case. But uh, for most people, you know, because of this, uh, this variance around the, 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 the rewards, most people are going to be earning less than the, than the cost of value. So actually, most people are going to be losing money staking, and a few people are going to be making money um, uh, uh, staking. So that makes everyone earn kind of the same the, the, the same rewards. And also, from a USD denominated perspective, uh, you know, presumably if there's more scarcity, the price of ETH is is worth more, and so you actually have more USD denominated rewards, even though the ETH denominated rewards uh, are the same. You also have more uh, economic efficiency in the sense that you don't need as much uh, issuance to pay for economic security. And the, the, the reason is that the amount of issuance grows uh, with uh, the, the, the total amount of stakers. And so we can, we can reduce the amount of stakers and, and therefore have less issuance and still have enough economic security to, for, for Ethereum. And then the final thing is that um, this kind of related to the scarcity. Um, you know, even though the total amount of ETH staked, uh, you know, will go down, it's possible that counterintuitively you'll have more economic security. And the reason is that again, the price of ETH might might be worth more, and so from a USD denominated standpoint, you might have more economic security. So all of this to to kind of to justify this this new precedence list that I think we should be uh, targeting for when we uh, redirect uh, MEV to various participants. And now on to Barnaby, I believe. Thank you, Justin. Uh, hi, everyone. I want to talk a bit about 
uh, protocol credibility and principal agent problems. Um, I'm told that there's an echo. Great. So can you move on to the next slide, please? In October, I released a post on unbundling PBS uh, with something I call Pepsi, Protocol Enforced Proposer Commitments. It allows the proposer to basically commit to any kind of executable contract, and the commitment is fully defended uh, by the protocol in the sense that uh, block validity depends on the satisfaction of the proposer uh, commitment. In particular, you can write PBS in, in Pepsi, but you can also do much more than that, so it's, it's much more general. And Pepsi came from a feeling that I was somewhat unsatisfied, let's say. I thought we don't really have a theory of protocol upgrades, and so we might as well give ourselves as much optionality as we can, and Pepsi is really maximum optionality in terms of what the proposer can uh, commit to. That's not to say that <clears throat> we shouldn't do protocol upgrades. I think we have a good intuition for them. We've done them in the past, and they worked pretty successfully. And there's something to be said for being iterative, community-driven, this kind of diffuse, pragmatic approach to, to protocol development. But the arc of Ethereum is the arc of any complexifying economy. So processes get more sophisticated. You have a division of labor that we call modularization in, in blockchain slang. If you can move on to the next slide, Justin. And so this division of labor, it fractures basically trust domains. It, it, more and more things get delegated. Uh, you have delegation, and if you have delegation, you have principal agent problems, these PAPs. Uh, and if you have principal agent problems, you have potentially misaligned incentives. And so we can always choose to protocolize uh, systemic PAPs, proto principal agent problems, but then we have to define what the system is. And in this conversation, I think we're often led to ask uh, what is the role of a protocol in that larger system of protocol and uh, infrastructure. And I don't think we can have this conversation properly uh, without having a bit more theoretical background on, on basically protocol uh, credibility. And so the discussion on credibility is really taking off at the moment along with commitments. To me, the groundbreaking work is Virgil's uh, Ethereum is game-changing technology, literally. Uh, but recently, Sheen from Flashbots has revived this conversation. Uh, he has a much more holistic theory of credibility and, and commitments. And I think in parallel, very much in the zeitgeist, uh, you're starting to see much more results on credibility in auctions and credibility in mechanism design uh, where you don't have, let's say, a central controller. And so what this conversation tells me is that there is this hierarchy of commitments and the reason why we want to put things in protocol is because we see that as being more credible. And so I want to just go a bit into why we might think that. In, and basically it's because the protocol gives us a shelling fence. The validator set says anything we put behind the fence, anything we put in the protocol, is going to be defended with the whole might of the validator set. But the protocol can only defend what it sees. So most of the upgrades that we do, they're really done with the aim of extending the vision of the, of the protocol. And I call it uh, seeing like a protocol. We want to make legible certain outcomes and certain pieces of infrastructure so that the protocol can control and uh, defend them. And so the aim is to get a credible signal. For instance, if we see a safety fault in the FFG uh, gadget, if we have the base fee, these are all credible signals of things that are happening uh, in the protocol. Next slide, please. And so this protocol credibility to me is, is the sum of two things, is this first protocol introspection and also protocol agency. So the more introspection we have, the more control and the more we can have actionable responses to events that are happening. So sometimes we don't want to go through the diffuse process of community government if there's a fault that we can't uh, control. For instance, people are driving base P to zero. It's not something that the protocol can see as a fault and we need to act as a community to, to defend against that. But there are faults that we can deal with pretty much automatically like slashing people who are finalizing and doing safety faults. But the trade-off here is that when we build in this protocol credibility, when we extend the boundary of our protocol, it means that we also need to become opinionated about outcomes that we want. And so there is a higher risk that we lock in 
kind of local optima or mechanisms that are suboptimal. But more importantly, when we do that, we also start overloading the validator set with the duty to defend more and more things. And we can do so, but then we must be convinced that we as a community are going to defend these mechanisms basically with the protocol's life for whatever falls under its zone of controls. For instance, we commit to forking out validators who subvert the censorship resistance gadget that we build in, the MEV burning, the finality gadgets, all of these gadgets. And to me, this feels like it gets harder as time goes on, because there are other domains like Suave or like Eigenlayer uh, that may directly shift the incentives of the validators, such that honest behavior and rational behavior start deferring more and more, especially when the protocol has locked in suboptimal outcome. And by suboptimal, I mean non-welfare maximizing, because when this is the case, uh, the welfare gap is basically a subsidy for bribing validators into, into doing the, the wrong thing. And so back to Pepsi, to me, the idea was nice because it creates this idea of programmable protocol credibility, but it may be at odds with the goals of zeroing in on a minimal set of gadgets that we are willing to defend with uh, basically the protocol's life. And that question is, is still uh, open in my mind. So yeah, I, I think we're getting closer to this theory of protocol upgrade. Uh, I think commitments, credibility, both have to do with that. And I'm excited to, to see what's next. I think we're a bit over time, but we should jump to the questions. Awesome. Great presentations, guys. Uh, so we will have a brief kind of question section here before we move on to the next one. Um, the first one I'll go up will be kind of basically getting uh, Davide and Barnabé your reactions a bit on kind of the MEV allocation and distribution type of convo for the most part. Um, I know, Davide, like you've written previously as far as MEV, al MEV allocation, the goal is basically distribute the captured MEV to participants in a way that is most beneficial to the protocol. Um, so that last part is really kind of what owns in on the question of how do we define what is that objective function of what is beneficial to the protocol that we're trying to optimize here, um, whether that be MEV smoothing, MEV burning, um, in particular because MEV smoothing does address some of those points um, that Justin had spoken about as far as the rear resistance and some of that kind of stuff. Um, so like how do you guys kind of think about what you're optimizing for here? Yeah. A uh, good question. So I think uh, uh, the answer is nuanced and it ties to like uh, parts of the presentation of Justin and Barnabé as well. So maybe I'll start and then th they can continue. So like in the ideal world, like what does most beneficial for the protocol means? I mean, the, the protocol is just like organizing all the participants, like users uh, and like service providers, validators in this case, right? So like on the user side, like the ideal allocation is essentially like a fair tax. So essentially like the MEV you contribute to the system and the MEV you get allocated. Like if you subtract those, they should be proportional to the externality that you bring to the system. Uh, and um, uh, on the other side, you also need to use uh, like part of this MEV to make sure that like the validator incentives are not uh, distorted, behaving honestly. So I think this ties to like uh, the uh, kind of precedence hierarchy that uh, Justin was talking about. And yeah, so I'm not sure if he wants to comment next also because it doesn't need, the allocation doesn't need to be monetary, could be purely fiscal, but it could also be monetary in the case of Burr. So what do you mean by fiscal? In the sense, uh, it's a trad, you could, or you could organize direct transfers, right? For example, in the case in the in the type of um, allocation that an OFA system would do, uh, there is a direct transfer back to the user. So essentially, the user is getting that MEV directly, not through um, uh, inflation or deflation. Uh, deflation in this case, yeah. Right. I mean, I. You know, there's a separation of the consensus layer and the execution layer, right? And like, I guess what you're saying is that the execution layer is the fiscal layer. And I mean, I don't think uh, users would, would get issuance, right? That's kind of the wrong layer because issuance is at the consensus layer, right? Okay. Yeah, I mean, Johnny made a good point around smoothing, you know, potentially solving some of, some of these issues. 
Um, smoothing doesn't solve the the, the, eco the economic bandwidth drought, basically, just uh, the staking, sucking egg. Um, yeah, and it's also unclear in terms of the, the reorgs, even the reorgs, like one of the ideas is that we have some sort of a small committee that's in charge of the, the smoothing, but this small committee is maybe not representative of the, the whole value data set. Or maybe it is, I don't know. Um, but uh, there's, there's some nuance there a little bit. Um, yeah, on that point, if I can comment, I think sometimes we also get the monetary policy that we can defend. And if we can't defend things like MEV burn or things like MEV smoothing, because they rely at the end of the day on this honest majority of committee to to defend these things, um, yeah, it might be something that we, we can't get. But um, I wanted to also mention some research that is done by Anders in our group on the dynamic yield curve and notably the idea of capping the size of the validator set and potentially even auctioning off uh, the slots of the validator set. That's, I would say, another way of internalizing that uh, MEV allocation uh, in the protocol. And in particular, if you get rewards from like Eigenlayer as a validator, you're going to be willing to pay more at this option. Uh, and so you can even internalize more than the execution layer uh, MEV via this mechanism. Or you could do both. I think that would be the ideal. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, wh one of the things that you mentioned is that uh, MEV burn or smoothing requires an honest majority. I, I do want to highlight that EIP-1559 also requires an honest majority. Um, and just for people to, to, to understand this, basically, if you have a if you have a dishonest majority, um, they control the fork choice rule, and then what they can do is that they can fork any 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 block that increases the base fee, and so basically the base fee is like decreasing only, and it goes to zero, and then you've just essentially deactivated the IP one five five nine. And actually, there's there's a lot of parallels between the IP one five five nine and MEV burn. It's just essentially the, the same mechanisms, the same dynamics. It's just on a different side of the coin. Uh, so moving on to one of the other questions that we had, uh, this one will be for you, Justin. It relates to s several of the earlier presentations that referenced it, um, but your recent post on base rollups, where the basic idea is letting the layer one kind of do the sequencing for these rollups, potentially. Um, and TLDR, a very simple MEV implication here is if you implement it in that simple form, um, basically the MEV that would normally accrue to rollup sequencers would start going to the L1 itself. Um, so the question here is kind of why is that such a desirable or undesirable feature of this? Um, and then in particular, um, is there kind of a tension here between now all the value goes to Ethereum and maybe this is kind of the dominant solution to them um, and compared to rollups should have their own incentives to continue to innovate and continue to grow over time. Um, is that kind of in any way a rejection of like the roll-up centric roadmap where we want this private market of people to be incentivized to go make these things? Right. I mean, on the on the topic of incentivization, I'm not at all worried about the roll-up teams, right? There's like $10 billion plus kind of market caps. I think they're doing very, very well. And, you know, for good reason, because, um, you know, they're, they're doing something very, very complicated that requires, you know, very big teams. It requires taking a lot of risk. Um, and and also the the fact that we have these tokens is kind of fuel to kind of almost disrupt a little bit the, the layer one network effects and create new network effects at layer two. So uh, I'm 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 all for like this uh, you know this capitalism as it, as it were at the at the rollup layer. Uh, but I think what will happen is that you know what is capitalism in the short and medium term might become you know commoditized eventually. It will be just like running water and electricity. Um, and, you know, there will be less and less of a, of a need for, for, for incentivization. Um, I mean, even the roll-up teams themselves, right, they want to be credibly neutral. They want to be maximally decentralized. And so they go, for example, from centralized sequencer to decentralized sequencer. They go from governance, you know, token governance for upgrades. And then, you know, they might remove the governance and become like Uniswap, you know, fully trustless. Um, and I think, you know, the move from being layer two sequence to being layer one sequence is part of this natural progression of, of progressive decentralization. And then once you've reached the, the, the base rollup, you know, the, the ultimate maybe goal 
uh, is to become an enshrined rollup. Um, and um, you know, I've, I'm I'm talking to the to the scroll founders, and you know that that's one of the things that they're thinking about, like how could scroll become an enshrined rollup? So there's kind of this this spectrum of of of, of rollups. Um, and by the way, my my definition of of, of a rollup is you know, when there is sufficient data on chain that you can recompute the, the, the state. Um, and so, you know, some of the rollups that people don't talk about is centralized rollups. So for example, Optimism today is a centralized rollup. It's a rollup because you can recompute the state, but it, it, it's centralized. And I think uh, another type of rollup that people are, um, you know, not looking into, but I'm, I'm, I'm relatively optimistic about is SGX rollups, um, where the security engine is, is, is SGX. But I think that what, we, what we're doing is we're progressively fleshing out this this whole design space of, of, of rollups, with and with rediscovering you know enshrine base blah blah blah. Um, in terms of the advantages, I think you know they really do lean highly towards credible neutrality, right? So it's like maximum security, maximum liveness, maximum decentralization, maximum simplicity, and so all of these things are you know tending towards the the, the mature side of the rollup. So I, what I expect will happen is that um, you know, the dominant rollups in the short and medium term will be the non-based ones and that eventually, you know, uh, maybe a, a, a based one. And uh, actually, one, one of the ideas that, we, that we've been thinking within the ultrasound team is like, should we launch an ultrasound rollup? And if we were to do such a thing, it, it, it necessarily must be, a, you know, a based rollup because that, that's kind of like the, the, the natural shunning point. Um, now, one one of the things that I, I think will happen with with rollups is that the is kind of winner take most because of the network effects, um, and so you know rollups need to be very strategic, right? On the on the one hand, they need to have a you know they need to move extremely fast, have the first move advantage, have a lot of of token fuel to do the, the boosting, but at the same time, they need to have this credible story that eventually you know they'll become you know maximally credibly neutral, and I think. Uh, and you know, adding becoming a base rollup as one of the line items in their roadmap um, could be a, could be a very powerful strategic move uh, for 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 them. And you know, one of the things that was uh, you know highlighted about base rollups is that it's it's a little unclear how you get some of the services like pre confirmations. Um, but I'm actually uh, you know relatively optimistic that uh, you know with things like eigenlayer uh, that we 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 can actually have uh, fast pre confirmation, so we can. You know, have our cake and eat it too. Have like all the advantages of non-base rollups and all the advantages of base rollups. Um, so yeah, the, the future is a bright for rollups for sure. A lot of different options. Um, I think we have. We'll squeeze it in one more since we started this a few minutes late. Um, this one kind of gets to the question of what is really the protocol job to kind of provide um, to everyone who's kind of using this ecosystem. Um, so it's a question that I had actually asked Phil earlier as well. Um, so curious to hear your guys take, um, it's regarding enshrined PBS. Um, and is this something that we actually need to do? Um, is this something that actually needs to be enshrined in the protocol at any point? Um, it's clearly not a near term action item that's happening imminently. Um, but there is that real risk of you enshrine something, a very specific structure, and crypto has a strong tendency of finding new existential risks every couple of years. Um, and you might find a new one of those a couple of years later and realize you wanted more flexibility. Um, so what are the downsides if we were not to do that? Um, and kind of how do you think about that? Um, starting with Barnabé on this one. Sure. Um, yeah, I thought Phil's answer was quite interesting to say that uh, basically, our job is to do research on providing nuclear options, or almost like deterrence from for people to to not do bad things, and for the market to stay clear. Um, I actually I, I'm pretty hopeful about let's say the development of PBS. Justin can probably talk more about this, but lately there's been like a lot of innovation, like optimistic relaying uh, towards this roadmap to to PBS. So to me, the risk was not to say that, okay, PBS is a bad idea. Clearly, I think you would want this clean interface of the protocol to communicate with what's outside of it. I think PBS is is, is probably part of the right one. Um, but I did want to see more data, more experimentation, more research. And it feels like we're at this point where, okay, every day there's like a new paper, not necessarily about PBS, but that can be applied to PBS or new data sets, new, new findings. Uh, and I'm, yeah, that, that makes me fairly confident about 
figuring out that nuclear option, like the shape of it, before we actually need to, to use it. Yeah, I mean, my my take is that um, you know, with and trying PBS is going to take a long time, you know, relative to how fast the blockchain space you know moves. It will take let's say two three years at the minimum, and in in two three years the MEV space is just dram going to dramatically change. Like you, every week, you know, the, the MEV space dramatically changes. We're just speed running the whole thing, and I, I'm hopeful that we'll have some sort of reasonable equilibrium in let's say one one and a half years or two years. And then that will be you know, close to the end game of, you know, the non-enshrined PBS, and then we'll be able to make an, an informed decision as to whether or not we, we really want enshrined PBS. But intuitively, as a roll-up operator, uh, I'd say, sorry, as a relay operator, I'd say we we really do want enshrined PBS. Like <laughs> being a relay operator is not it's not good. Like um, on the one hand, you know, there's it's kind of a lot of work. Uh, and you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of, of pitfalls, but one of the things that I've been thinking about is, okay, you know, how can the role of the relay be abused? Like what happens if someone hacks our relay? And I believe that if someone hacks our relay, they can steal millions of dollars. <laughs> so basically it's, it, it's, it's a high kind of trust uh, environment. You know, you could collude with the builders, you could collude with the, the validators. There's all sorts of, 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 of attacks many of which are not documented. And, uh, you know, really you just want to remove this, this, this trusted uh, entity uh, as, as quickly as possible. Um, but yeah, it is possible that there's some very, very clever technique that re allows us to remove the trusted entity without enshrined PBS. And I think Flashbots, for example, is working on using SGX, you know, to remove uh, the relay. And I think, you know, as Van Abbe mentioned, there's, there's this whole roadmap that we have now that's, you know, been written by Mike Nuder, basically documenting, uh, you know, a, a progression for optimistic relaying, which incrementally brings us towards enshrined PBS. And I, I, yeah, I, I encourage you to read it because it, 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 it kind of shows you almost how how natural the the, the enshrined PBS uh, should be in, uh, in 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 a few years. Awesome! This was a lot of fun. I don't want to keep uh, Patrick waiting any longer. Um, so thank you again, all of you guys. This one was really, really great.